A November morning in suburban Woodbury, Minnesota, 38-year-old Sharon Bloom kisses her live-in boyfriend, David Kofod, goodbye and joins the morning commute. She arrives at work around 7.30 a.m., but fails to make it home in time for dinner. Calls to her cubicle go unanswered, and Kofod begins to worry. Bloom hasn't been missing long enough for police to get involved. Kofod, however, feels certain something is wrong. He calls back to 3M and asks workers on the night shift to take a walk through the employee parking lot. And at 11, approximately, I got a call back. They told me her car was still in the parking lot. Kofod stays up all night, waiting by a phone that never rings. On Friday morning, he files a missing persons report with the Woodbury Police Department. Investigator David Hines is assigned to the case. He begins with Bloom's car. For her to leave that behind didn't make any sense. We were quickly getting to the idea that she had definitely disappeared from the workplace. It didn't take us very long to kind of zero in on the fact that we don't think she was ever back at work after the lunch hour. Hines pokes his head into every cubicle on Bloom's floor. Beneath the corporate veneer, he finds a hostile work environment. The primary target, Sharon Bloom. Over the past year, Bloom's keys had been stolen from her desk four times, documents or presentations pilfered, and most recently, someone dumped a pot of coffee on her chair. There was quite a series of incidents, and it was quite clear that this was not just the usual workplace prank kind of thing. This was somebody who was definitely zeroing in on her and, and um, harassing her with a purpose. One day she came home and was in tears, and her reaction was, what could I have done to somebody that could cause them to hate me so much? Bloom had working relationships with dozens of people. On the day Sharon disappeared, all of them returned to their office after lunch, save one, a systems analyst named Steven Zanter. He offered us an alibi right away, but it was an alibi that wasn't alibying him. It was an alibi that made no sense, in fact. Zanter tells detectives he left work shortly after 11 a.m. After lunch at a fast food restaurant, Zanter says he did not return to work because his car broke down. After that, according to Zanter, he went home. He didn't see anybody that he knew. Uh, there was nobody that he knew of that could verify any of it. It was really accounted for his time, but it was in a way that um, he almost went out of his way to, to let us know that no one could verify this. The shaky alibi prompts Hines to examine Xanter's office politics. He finds bad blood between the suspect and the missing woman. The two had competed for a promotion. Sharon Bloom got it, Stephen Xanter didn't. We have a guy who's a problem. We have a guy who others think could be capable of harassment. He's given us an alibi that is just really, well, lame. Eight days into the investigation, Hines calls in reinforcements. The state's premier investigative agency, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, Agent Ray DePrima reviews the case file and concurs with Investigator Hines' suspicions. All eyes now fall to Stephen Zanter. DePrima and Hines take a ride out to Zanter's home to give the suspect an opportunity to flush out his story. Three hours into the interview, Xanter is rock solid, his demeanor calm, his story unchanged. Detectives are about to pack it in, but Ray DePrima takes a phone call, one that changes everything. And as we're conducting the interview, my pager went off, and uh, I was informed by my supervisor that uh, Sharon Bloom's body had been found in a cornfield. She obviously had uh, head trauma, and beyond that, um, there was no sign of uh, any struggle. It had looked as if she had just been placed there. The body is naked from the waist down to an experienced detective strongly suggestive of sexual assault. Seeing someone that way, uh, partially clad, uh, bra pushed up, it had appeared she had been raped. Biological samples are collected from the body, as well as human hair found at the dump site and determined not to belong to the victim. 
Bloom's body is transported to the morgue for autopsy. At the same time, Agent De Prima breaks the news to the man he suspects might have killed her, Stephen Zanter. He fell to pieces. He just sort of dropped. Uh, we were in his family room, and he uh, became catatonic. He uh, started crying, became almost convulsive, and he was on the floor. He went, he went all the way around his, his family room on his knees. Detectives are unsure of what to make of Xander's behavior, but lack the physical evidence to charge him with Bloom's murder. The following day, the investigation is dealt a critical blow when the coroner informs detectives that biological samples they thought might be semen are not. And he told us what I thought was seminal fluid was not. It was premenstrual discharge. Without a semen sample, the case against Stephen Zanter amounts to two strands of human hair, determined to be similar to the suspects, but far from enough to make a case for murder. In time, the investigation stalls, then goes cold. That is until Stephen Zanter's wife starts talking to her friends. Barbara and I were good friends. In 1989, Joe Sorensen worked with Barbara Zanter at Woodland Elementary School. Sorensen tells De Prima she recalls a school meeting she and Barbara attended where the topic of conversation shifted from books to blood. At that meeting, she brought up the fact that she wanted to know if anyone knew how to get blood out of their new carpeting because they just moved into this new house and Steve had had an accident or something and he got blood all over and she wanted to know if we knew how to remove it. According to Barb Zanter, the blood trail went across her new carpet, up the stairs, and into a bathroom on the second floor. She didn't give a lot of detail about the way it looked, except she did use the word splattered. De Prima needs to verify Sorensen's story. He asks if she and Barb's other friends would be willing to help him out. He asked if, if we would be willing to tape conversations with Barb. Revelations recorded around Joe Sorensen's kitchen table add up to a probable cause for a search warrant. On March 4th, 1992, investigators descend upon the Xanter home. Fluorescence from luminal testing indicates the presence of blood throughout the second floor. The other search teams in the basement did locate a set of keys that were later identified as keys belonging to Sharon Bloom. As we left that day, I felt the case was uh, solved. Got the blood, uh, we'd got the keys. As it turned out, it was only the beginning. On October 23, 1992, a grand jury indicts Stephen Zanter on a charge of murder. Three years later, however, the case has still not gone to trial. His defense attorney submitted a motion to suppress the evidence, especially the keys. It went to the Minnesota Supreme Court, and they threw the keys out, you know, claiming that we had overstepped our bounds, that we didn't have probable cause to seize the keys, that we only had probable cause to seize the blood. Without the keys, the prosecution has left no direct physical link between the blood in Steve Zanter's carpet and Bloom. Basically, at that point in time, DNA was not as sophisticated as it is now. The blood evidence in the carpet had been diluted with a number of uh, chemicals to clean the carpet. And they could say it was consistent with, but they couldn't say that it was specifically Sharon Bloom's blood. Unwilling to risk a possible acquittal, Rice County's prosecutors reluctantly dropped the charges, leaving David Kofod with the name of his girlfriend's suspected killer and nothing at all he can do about it. By 1999, the forensic revolution is underway. Short tandem repeat, or STR DNA testing, breathes new life into old cases by detecting strains of DNA where there once appeared to be none. In March of 1999, she turns her attention to a section of bloody carpet pulled from the home of murder suspect, Stephen Zanter. She then compares the unknown profile to the genetic signature of the victim. The blood then on the carpeting matched the DNA profile um, from the blood of the victim. In addition to the blood evidence, 
a hair found at the body dump site, is linked through mitochondrial DNA to samples provided by Stephen Zanter. Faced with the daunting physical evidence, Zanter confesses to the crime in April 2003 and is sentenced to 25 years behind the walls of Minnesota's Stillwell Penitentiary. <laughs>